in this lecture video, I'm going to start teaching you guys about coupling reactions. If I've got this type of molecule, this is called a vinyl halide, it's where I've got a halogen, in this case a chlorine, coming directly off of one of the two carbons in a double bond. You'll note that this carbon that's attached to the chlorine is sp2 hybridized. Now if I react that with an organolithium or a Grignard reagent, you might try to imagine that I've got a negative charge on the carbon here that's bonded to the magnesium, and it's going to come in here, form a bond with this carbon, and then kick off the chlorine, right? Wrong. As it turns out, this does not happen. The reason is because you can't have a nucleophile come in and form a bond with sp2 hybridized carbon like this while kicking off a halide. It just doesn't work. Let me show you another example. I've got, for instance, this type of molecule. It's a phenyl halide, stuck to a bromine in this case. You'll note that, once again, this carbon center is sp2 hybridized. If I attempted to react that with a Grignard reagent, you might try to imagine that this negatively charged carbon bonded the magnesium, might come in here, form a bond with this carbon on the benzene ring, and kick off the bromide, SN2 style, to give me a product. And guess what? You'd be wrong. This totally doesn't work. Because once again, this carbon is sp2 hybridized. You can't have a nucleophile come into an sp2 hybridized carbon and kick off a leaving group like a halide. The reason is because sp2 hybridized carbons just have too much electron density. So what in the world can we do? Is there any way to make this type of reaction happen? In other words, is there any way that I can take a vinyl halide or a phenyl halide like this and replace the halogen atoms with some kind of hydrocarbon chain? Is that possible? As it turns out, the answer is yes. We can do this type of transformation, and it requires us to do one of various types of reactions that we call coupling reactions. I'm going to teach you some number of those in the ensuing lecture video. The first of those is a coupling reaction using an organocuprate, which is also called a Gilman reagent, like this. I want you to look at this closely. I've got an alkyl halide, and in fact this bromine here is stuck to an sp3 hybridized carbon, but this type of reaction can also work with an sp2 hybridized carbon. And I react it with this type of molecule. I've got copper stuck to lithium stuck to two different hydrocarbon chains. These two hydrocarbon chains have to be the same as each other, and they can essentially be anything I want. What ends up happening is whatever these carbon chains are, one of them ends up taking the place of the halogen to give me my final product. This type of reagent is once again called an organocuprate reagent, also a Gilman reagent, and this is a coupling reaction. Okay, so as I stated already, organocuprates do work on vinyl and phenyl halides. Let me show you some examples. If I've got a halogen, in this case a bromide, directly stuck to a carbon-carbon double bond, this is totally a vinyl bromide, and I react it with a Gilman reagent, an organocuprate. You can see that this copper is stuck to two ethyl groups. What ends up happening? The halogen, the bromine, ends up being replaced by an ethyl group. So once again, whatever is attached to this copper, one of those ends up taking the place of the halogen in my product. Here's another example. I've got an iodine stuck to a phenyl ring. I've got a Gilman or organocuprate reagent right here. In this case, my copper stuck to two CH3s. In my product, I end up seeing this iodine, my halogen, being completely replaced by one of these CH3s. So once again, this is a way that you can take a halogen that's stuck to an sp2 hybridized carbon, such as a vinyl halide, or a phenyl halide, and replace the halogen with an alkyl chain. Now one thing I want to stress is this. The mechanism for this reaction is not an SN2. In other words, this is not a negatively charged carbon coming in here and kicking off the bromide, or negatively charged carbon coming in here and kicking off the iodide. The mechanism is very different. Now for you, my students, I don't require you to know the mechanism. However, you can ask me outside of class if you'd like to know it, or if you want to, you can just look it up. Now there are numerous other types of coupling reactions that can do these types of transformations. Another coupling reaction involves using alkyl boranes and a palladium catalyst. When I write L here, the letter L is a generic term that just refers to some ligand, and you don't have to care about what that is. You treat these under basic conditions, that is, adding hydroxide, and you can do something similar. This type of reaction is called a Suzuki reaction. 
I'll go ahead and show you some examples. I've got here a vinyl halide. It's a bromine stuck directly to a carbon-carbon double bond, and I react it with this type of molecule called an alkyl borane. I also treat it with palladium L2 and hydroxide. Whatever the carbon chain is that atta that's attached to this boron, that carbon chain ends up replacing the halogen in my final product. And conveniently, I don't get any type of messing with my stereochemistry. In other words, this started out with the bromine trans to this methyl. It ends up totally trans in my product, and I don't have to worry about any cis products being formed. Here's another example. You'll note that I've got a phenyl halide, phenyl iodide in this case. This whole group has one, two, three, four carbons bonded to this boron. What ends up happening is this alkyl chain stuck to my boron completely replaces this iodine, so I end up getting one, two, three, four carbons dangling off of this benzene ring in my product. Note that this carbon-carbon double bond that was adjacent to this bond ends up remaining completely untouched in the product. Here's an additional example. I've got this phenyl bromide right here reacting with this phenyl borane. I, of course, treat it with palladium L2 and hydroxide, and what ends up happening is this alkyl group, a benzene ring, ends up completely taking the place of the halide in my starting material, giving me this product. This type of reaction is called a Suzuki reaction. So this brings us to some example questions from our problem set. Predict the products of the following Suzuki reactions. Once again, I've got different alkyl boranes reacting with alkyl halides. I, of course, add palladium L2 and hydroxide. What types of products am I going to get? You're welcome to pause the movie right now if you wish, because I'm going to give you the answers momentarily. Here's the first. Once again, I've got this alkyl group, this phenyl ring that has a methoxy group attached to it, bonded to this borane over here. And I'm reacting that with this alkyl bromide, PDL2, and hydroxide. How in the world do I determine what the product that's going to be formed is out of this reaction? The way I do that is by asking myself, what group is attached to the boron? Well, of course I can see that it's this group. The next question I ask myself is, where is my halogen in my other reactant? Here it is. Now, for the sake of keeping track of stuff, I've also numbered the carbons in my alkyl halide. One, two, three. So what type of product do I end up getting? Well, all I do is take this alkyl halide and I replace the bromine with whatever group is attached to my boron. So my product ends up being this. You'll note once again I've got my carbons, one, two, three, that originated from my alkyl bromide. I hope you can see clearly that what's happened is that the bromine has been replaced by the alkyl chain that was attached to my boron. This is exactly what a Suzuki reaction does. It's super cool, and parenthetically I have to mention, most of these reactions in real life are super easy to run. I've run many, many, many of them, and they work very nicely. Here's our next example. I've got my alkyl borane reacting with this alkyl halide, in this case an alkyl iodide. I, of course, treat it with palladium L2 and hydroxide. How do I determine what the product is? My first question that I ask is, what is the group attached to my boron? Well, of course, it's this group. The next question I ask is, where is my halogen in my alkyl halide coupling partner? It's right here. For the sake of keeping track of stuff, I'm going to number my carbons in my alkyl halide. One, two, three, four. And now I remember, in a Suzuki reaction, what happens is the group that's attached to my boron ends up taking the place of the halide in my alkyl halide. Thus, my product ends up being this product. And for the sake of keeping track of stuff, I've numbered my atoms, one, two, three, four, that came from my original alkyl halide. One thing that I have to stress is the importance of the fact that this isopropyl group attached to my phenyl ring ends up being in the same relative position as it was to the boron in my original alkyl borane. You'll notice that this boron is attached to a position that's one, two, three away from this isopropyl group, and this alkyl chain from my alkyl halide also ends up being attached one, two, three away from the isopropyl group. This is the Suzuki reaction. The next coupling reaction in our lineup involves taking an alkene, a palladium L2 catalyst, and triethylamine. This type of reaction is called a Heck reaction. 
And no, that isn't supposed to be G-rated profanity. It's actually called that because it's named after somebody whose last name was Hank. Here's how that reaction goes down. I take a vinyl or an aryl halide. Now, this R group, once again, has to be in sp2 hybridized carbon, in a carbon-carbon double bond, or in a benzene ring of some sort. So this can't be an sp3 hybridized carbon for the heck reaction. I react it with an alkene that can be attached to a hydrogen or an alkyl chain on one side, and more or less any group that I want on the other side. I treat it with palladium L2 and triethylamine, and what ends up occurring is this hydrogen or alkyl group over here ends up being replaced by the vinyl or aryl group attached to my halogen on this side, giving me this alkene product where R and Z are always, always trans to each other. Let me show you some specific examples. I've got this vinyl iodide right here being reacted with this alkene. You'll notice that this alkene happens to be attached to all of this exciting stuff over here. I treat with palladium L2 and triethylamine, and what ends up occurring is I form a bond between this carbon that was formerly bonded to the iodine and this terminal carbon in my alkene, as you can see right here. All of this stuff over here ends up being trans to all of the stuff over here when this bond forms. In the second example, I've got a phenyl bromide being treated with this molecule called ethene, or sometimes just ethylene. I react it with palladium L2 and triethylamine under heck conditions. I end up forming a bond between this carbon and one of these two carbons in the alkene. This is the heck reaction. Which brings us to some excellent questions from our problem set. I want you to predict the products of the following heck reactions. Now, of course, I'm going to show you the answers to these in the next slides. So if you wish to, you're welcome to pause the video now and attempt them on your own first. In our first example, I've got this vinyl bromide, that is a bromine coming directly off of an alkene, being treated with palladium L2, triethylamine, and yes, this ET group stands for ethyl, not extraterrestrial. I react it with this alkene. So how do I navigate my way through this problem and determine what the product is that's going to be formed? What I need to do is first of all ask myself, where is the terminal carbon in my alkene coupling partner? It's of course right here. Where is my halogen in my vinyl or aryl halide? It's of course right here. And for the sake of keeping track of stuff, I've numbered all of the carbons in our alkene coupling partner. One, two, and three. So what ends up occurring is this carbon, carbon one, ends up taking the place of my bromine in my vinyl bromide, ultimately giving rise to this product, where I've got my carbons one, two, and three right here. So once again, you can see carbon one that originated from this alkene, forming a bond with the carbon that was originally bonded to this bromine. The double bond that's formed here always ends up putting these two groups trans to each other in the product. Here's our next example. I've got this phenyl iodide reacting with this alkene. I once again ask myself the question, where is the terminal carbon in my carbon-carbon double bond in my alkene coupling partner? The answer is, of course, right here. And where is my halogen in my aryl or vinyl halide? It is, of course, right here. I'm going to once again number my carbons, one, two, three, in my coupling partner so that we can keep track of stuff. As I've stated before, what ends up occurring is that this carbon right here, which is bonded to my iodine, ends up forming a bond with carbon one in my alkene, ultimately giving rise to this product, one, two, three. As stated before, these two groups, the phenyl ring and all of this exciting stuff over here, always end up being trans to each other around the double bond. So here are some problem set problems I'll throw at you, but let you do on your own. I want you to predict the products of the following heck reactions. I've got two different vinyl halides reacting with the same alkene coupling partner with palladium L2 and triethylamine. I'm not going to show you the answers to these, but will instead let you work them out on your own. That brings us to the end of this lecture. Until next time, have an enjoyable rest of your day.